Good evening. As some of you know, I'm Paul Bright, the director of Haynes Gallery. Before I start, I'd like to thank the Pro Humanitat Institute and Norman Mehizakov for bringing me here to invite me to speak, actually. I've been here. <laughs> uh, also, Martin Berger, the curator of Freedom Now, the show that's around you here. Uh, David Lubin, our Charlotte C. Weber Professor of Art, for suggesting the exhibition and inviting Martin Berger to come and speak to us. John Berger, artist, critic, novelist, and essayist. And Ernst Gombrich, art historian. Those of you who have heard me speak before know that I always offer a caveat, especially to my art historian colleagues. I'm not a specialist, and I'm not an art historian. So if you hear anything that seems like I might be bumping up against art history, it's merely coincidental. Today especially, I offer the same disclaimer to any social scientist present. The idea for this talk came from a casual conversation I had not too long ago with Norma Manning about the exhibition Freedom Now, the ideas and approach of its curator, Martin Berger, and then both of us bringing up John Berger. And aside from the literally nominal coincidence of their names, the ways their concerns echo each other and are intertwined. What constitutes seeing, looking, and visibility? How do we see color in different contexts? Of the images we create of the world, how do we select those for the stories we tell ourselves? Where does white end and black begin? First, I'll look a bit at the process of visual perception from the physiological and empirical perspectives, then follow with a development of related themes, those of seeing, looking, and visibility, investigated respectively by John Berger, as he prefers his name to be pronounced, in his seminal ways of seeing, and Martin Berger in the current exhibition, Freedom Now, forgotten photographs of the civil rights struggle, then modified by their approaches and related ideas I'll revisit the theme of perception in the context of race, not in any way to trivialize it, nor to offer a unified approach to its problems. After all, this is just one narrow perspective on one aspect of its dynamics. But because I think that our blind spots and perceptual flaws fundamentally link different kinds of seeing and looking. In doing so, I will move from subjects I know something about towards issues of which I have no expertise other than that conferred on my ancient citizenship. Back in the fall, I gave a talk related to Spencer Finch's exhibition here concerning perception and color. It may not be the first thing one would connect to the concerns of the Berger Burgers or to racially inflected issues, but I think it turns out to have more than just a metaphoric relationship to the work in Freedom Now, and the issue is raised in the ways of seeing. The umbrella of perception covers today's topics, as well as the ones I previously discussed. For most of us, visual ability is at the top of our sense hierarchy. It tends to crowd out and even bully the other senses, and because it has claimed such prominence, we tend to accept our eyes' findings generally without too much skepticism. Even though we've been shown circumstances purposely created or encountered in the course of life that demonstrate how our sense of sight lies to us, makes things up, gets confused, and won't admit it. When I discussed color perception in the fall, I evoked artist Joseph Albers, who created a very influential and useful pedagogy based on our experience of color, how we need to be instructed and sensitized to properly see it, how color deceives all of us, how our perception of it is always conditional, how our color sensitivity varies by individual. To demonstrate, we'll look at a few of, his, of Albert's examples. One of the precepts of his teaching is that color and value, that is, hue and the degree of lightness and darkness, are not absolutes. They are conditional and contextual. The same color surrounded by two different other colors is going to appear different itself. The context destabilizes what we firmly thought was one static chromatic entity. In these two examples, the figures, the small rectangles and the larger fields, 
are respectively the same purple and the same gray. Instructively, another exercise is more difficult. Make two colors appear the same by carefully calibrating the hues that surround them, as here. And here we see what really constitutes those figure colors in the grounds. Color's slippery mutability becomes more evident, for example, when we perceive, perceive it at its margins, where it transitions to another. Is it a greenish blue or a bluish green? Of course, we have invented tools and technologies to remarkably extend our vision, but the human organism still has to perceive and interpret even these perceptions. With value as a primary element in two-dimensional art, we can be fooled by figure ground reversals in the conventions of seeing an object is often perceived to be in a field or ground that surrounds it, much like the smaller rectangles in the color studies we just looked at. These conventions and assumptions can be inverted and flipped back and forth. We are all familiar with the elaborate mutations of figure and ground in the work of M.C. Escher, but equally effective examples are numerous. There are instances where black can seem to be in front of white. Text usually works this way, black letters on a white page. Well, the space between objects can sometimes become an object itself. Some of the mechanisms for this are familiar from Gestalt theory. The fabrications that comprise much visual art can live or die by these and other more subtle illusions. And it is through illusions in this case that art has something to say back to reality and to reveal about our experience of it. Our eyes represent a compromise between acuity, color vision, frequency response, and sensitivity to movement. Film and television take advantage of our so-called persistence of vision where things that occur faster than about every tenth of a second create gaps that our minds fill in, carrying information over from the last visual event to the next one. If we could see motion better, we would perceive the individual frames of the film or the digital artifacts on an LCD monitor. Most of us have played the blind spot game, finding that place in the visual field that does not get resolved by our retinas. The missing information is extrapolated usually from information from the opposite eye. An object has no color. Color is merely our interpretation of the frequency of reflected or projected light. You're probably familiar with images of deep space with vivid color based on frequencies invisible to the eye. These are artificially augmented and are called false color images, but all color images are false. These particular ones were made outside the range of our visual perception and recalibrated so as to be sub subject to its familiar interpretations. We are limited and not imprisoned by our biology, physiology, and psychology. These limits help form a kind of set of conventions by which our eyes, in this case, and our minds operate to interpret the stimuli they receive. Pliny observed that the mind is the real instrument of sight and observation, that the eyes act as a sort of vessel, receiving and transmitting the visible portion of our consciousness. And so we form our empirical reality. But I think it's important to remember that it's just ours, not of frogs or ants or dogs, like in the simulated view, and that there is considerable individual variation even between us. Other interpretations exist to form different realities. People who are congenitally blind dream with imagery, apparently. Even without the stimulus the eyes convey, we can create a visual world. Another presence that informs this discussion is that of our historian Ernst Gombrich, who, along with others following Pliny, asserts that we project, we visually construct the world as much as we see it. And we see mostly what we have been conditioned and expected and expect to find according to conventions. Gombrich notes that the, strike, the starting point of creating a visual record is not really knowledge, 
but a guest conditioned by habit and tradition, by convention and conformity. Forming this record begins not with a visual perception or impression, but with an idea or concept. So while John Berger reminds us that seeing comes before words, the meaning of what we see is greatly influenced by received ideas. As an example of this effect, we have a John White watercolor of a Native American in the 1580s. Vogan, the Apollo Belvedere, itself a Roman copy from about 130 AD, of the Greek original from about 350 BC. In my fall talk, I also spent a little time with Ludwig Wittgenstein, the important philosopher. Some of Wittgenstein's last writings concerned how words, how meaning and discussing colors, how, excuse me, how naming and discussing colors, subsequently influences our perception of them as well. Color, perception, images are immensely complex, and like most things that we encounter in life that are, we develop shorthands and conventions for dealing with them to get through the day. Due to the limitations of our physiology, and because we cannot pay attention to everything and still function, we have developed habits and shortcuts that are sometimes called heuristics. The heuristic, this heuristic thinking is like intuition in that it can feel innate and natural, but actually is culturally conditioned and can, like intuition, be trained. Blue is heuristic for a broad range of hues, as is red or black for value. Gabrick once more, the creation of a name and the creation of an image have much in common, both perceived by classifying the unfamiliar with the familiar. We need to be careful how we name. But now I want to go back to a time, to the early 70s, before the period was subjected to the nostalgia mill. Look at this shirt. <laughs> John Berger created the BBC television series and later the book, Ways of Seeing that aired in 1972, into which he brought his particular brand, blend of passionate humanism and critical inquiry to bear on the history of Western images from the Renaissance on. His approach was to deconstruct the way we often view the images and art we create by questioning the cultural conditioning, reflexive assumptions, and selectivity we often employ when viewing and processing them. His approach was part of a historical moment imbued with neo-Marxism, along with feminism, class and race consciousness, and environmentalism. Watching the series again, it was startling to realize, aside from the dated clothes and production values, how well it has held up. And I think part of the reason it has done so, that in some ways it still seems fresh, is because the ideas presented and the message conveyed this particular dialectic, to sound a little more academic, was only intellectually acknowledged and never fully assimilated. For many people, even when these ideas were accepted, they did not otherwise become internalized on a lived or emotional level. And then the movement was lost to the hyper-materialist, beyond all else, post-everything, 1980s and 90s, when the sculpted earnestness of Berger was supplanted in the era of Madonna. We were delivered to the 2000s with some people thinking that we had broken through to a post-historical, post-feminist, post-racial idol. How very ridiculous that sounded then and seems even more so now. Because there had been some advancement of the status of women and minorities from the 1960s to the 80s, there was a sense among the general population that, okay, no more disruption. We've done enough to solve these problems, so let's get back to normality. Let's get back to work. And speaking of work, it was economically that those gains were most visible. And in the reductive nature of late capitalism, that seemed adequate to many people. So ways of seeing seems almost new again, in part because its message, which grew louder for a while, eventually failed to take complete hold outside the academy and was subsumed in more purely corporate and material concerns, those that are the easiest to succumb to consumer societies. There was, in the end, less dialectic and more materialism. John Berger's series was presented in four 30-minute segments. He consulted the writings of Walter Benjamin, 
especially the seminal essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction from 1936, which posited that for most of history, the only way one could experience a work of art was to be in its presence, to see it in person. But with photography and printing processes of increasing fidelity, that singular work of art could end be endlessly reproduced, manipulated, put in new contexts, and used for all sorts of purposes having nothing to do with the intent or established meaning of the work in question. Sometimes these reproductions were more believable fictions than others, but all reduced the primacy of the idea of the original, erasing the aura, as he famously named the complex of qualities a unique art object accretes and exudes. It traded its singularity of scale for mobility and proliferation, for its ideological mutability as image. Berger presciently asserts that this process flattens the image to merely a form of information, co-equal to the news and advertisements that may appear next to on a page or a screen. For Berger, an attempt at compensation for, or the last vestige of, art's lost aura was its market valuation, which maintained a mystical, inscrutable relationship to the thing itself. Obviously, this mystery has only deepened in our time. The second episode concerns itself with the effects of what we would now call the male gaze, the reflexive self-surveillance that women often unconsciously perform for an assumed audience, usually male, an internalized self-scrutiny that at least heterosexual males did not suffer so much from. Berger examines the difference between nakedness and nudity as states and constructs. He asserts that the nude in art is a presentation of nakedness as others, especially the presumptive male observer, want it to be seen and displayed. Nudes, both as paintings and the women depicted, were presented as a kind of property in his view. He moves from the soft availability depicted by Titian to Manet's far more direct repost of a return gaze. We can see how this territory has become more fraught in recent years with the economic rise and prominence of some women and the fitful but increasing acceptance and visibility of people across the spectrum of sexuality and gender. And since money is part of the sex power dialectic, we can add to that the increasing anxieties of the male working and middle classes, growing in tandem with our economic disparity. Of course, in our time, the objectifying scope of the gaze has not shrunk so much as adapted itself, affecting even more of us like a virus. And we should extend the discussion of the idea to that of a white gaze, still evident in the otherwise advanced Manet, or blackness for some, functions in a way analogous to nudity, nudity in the works Berger discusses. It is traditionally Images of non-whites were presented to a white audience to confirm and conform to their established ideas, however contradictory, cool and virile, or humble and assimilating. Ingratiating and magical, everyone wants to be white, right? The third episode concerns Berger's focus specifically on the history of the tradition of oil painting in Western culture from the Renaissance to the end of the 19th century, a tradition that he views, as any good Marxist would, as one primarily of the depiction of wealth and property, of the reach of a colonizing and exoticizing capitalism. In a way we might describe as meta-significant, Berger shows the paintings functioning as visual catalogs of owned objects, as in Dutch still life, while at the same time being one of those owned objects painting as property and depicting the same, functioning simultaneously as sign and signifier. Our current art market embodies the paradox somewhat differently. Many of the works collected and sold for very large amounts of money began their lives as, as at least tacitly critical or ambivalent towards the system that now subsumes them almost entirely as a form of social and economic currency. Art Duke Wilhelm and his collection in the 17th century, or is it Charles Saatchi? Images of the profusion of wealth and status, landscapes with landed gentry and country estates, 
tarted up mythological scenes, Bertrand points out that the ethics and erotics of what was depicted were assumed to be conferred to the owners of these works. In the fourth and final episode, Bertrand demonstrates the strategies that advertising and its images employ using the formal language, the status of association, or the gestures and attitudes native to painting and art. Picking up a representational painting falls away in the 20th century. In his early non-academic instance, Bertrand dissects the mechanism of created needs, fantasies of escape and exclusivity, power, lust, usually the stereotypically male kind, and the feeding of status anxieties advertising homes so well. Berger asserts that these images have largely replaced the previous energy of painting. But while painting in the past did at least illustrate what constituted the world and people of privileged wealth, advertising images serve not to show accomplishment or accumulation so much as aspiration towards them through the green vitality of envy and money. If you only had this thing, you would be this person, like the people depicted here and over here, everywhere but where you are, with everything but what you have. These last two images could be from a retro-contemporary ad, but they are of Christine Keeler, who rose quickly to notoriety during the John Perfumer Affair in England in 1963. Celebrity is glamour, is impetus for envy in almost every instance. Martin Berger, in the exhibition he's curated, Freedom Now, Forgotten Photographs of the Civil Rights Struggle, emphasizes that he doesn't want to replace the existing canon of images of the era, many of them iconic, so much as expand it with a greater variety of images that establishes a more complex narrative. The images that form the canon as Berger pointed out in both his very engaging talk and the catalog for the show, offer a deliberately narrow perspective selected by editors and publishers for the, for the creation and dissemination of a specific story, mostly one that could sell to white northern audiences and readers who themselves had inherited conventional narratives of southern blackness since the Civil War and abolition. Berger makes clear that the images of the struggle often followed a convention of portraying African Americans as passive victims, characterized by the media's overuse of the label passive resistance. While the participants favored the term nonviolent direct action, the selected canonical images tend to be either aggrandize sympathetic whites in their roles in assisting the struggle or demonize those opposing it, while editors and publishers White editors and publishers were in a position to control the narrative to a large degree. The images they chose primarily offered clear, unnuanced, uncomplicated views of black victimhood, while assuaging white audiences' fear of chaotic social unrest that would threaten their historical status. Martin Berger acknowledges that the dissemination of the story through these iconic photos served to further the cause of civil rights. The widely reproduced images functioned to change the attitudes of many Northern whites and helped foster the subsequent legal changes with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. But this widening of awareness came at the cost of a more profound understanding of the various forces, actions, and people that constituted the movement. As a corrective, Berger has uncovered and brought forth images like the last two here and the two that follow which enrich our view and evoke texture and human scale, detail, categorizing them in the sections that you see here in the gallery around you, following the canon, historical precedents, doctored, strength, women, children and youths, and joy. We encounter blind spots in many accounts, many accounts of news and events, often willful, sometimes well-meaning, frequently self-serving. Climate change is a current topic that strikes some observers right at this sort of point. Many photojournalistic narratives of the civil rights struggle, Berger points out, reflect a tabloid fixation on the violence and tension, creating images of it even where they did not fully exist, 
and cropping or attaching misleading captions to image to further the drama, enacting Gombrich's ob observation that in unself-aware scene, we employ even less of a will to form than will to come form. Our assimilation of any new image is according to a schemata and patterns we've already learned. Berger points out that the canonical images particularly do not offer many specifics about place or participants. Like most icons, they function primarily as symbols or signs. Summarizing a larger story and leaving it to the audience to fill in the details of what they think they know about the narrative. This almost genericizing treatment of images reflects stereotypical seeing, a kind of profile, where only the, co only the coarsest outline of a thing, situation, or person seems required to make assumptions about them. Gobert points out a similar occurrence in the Nuremberg Chronicles, where a standard woodcut image of a city was used to illustrate several very different places. Damascus, Mantova, whatever. But hey, it's a city, right? An icon for cityness, 15th century version. Perception, color, value. These terms might seem to be double entendres in my discussion, but from their role in understanding the biological, physiological, and psychological workings of perception that are so necessary in art that I initially discussed, we arrive at the juncture where they also intersect perennial socio-political issues of color and race, raised again in the poignant topicality this past year. It's tempted to use those terms of visualization, of seeing and looking, concretely in the first instances and more metaphorically in the later ones. However, these issues of race and racism, of authority and its application, form an overlay that complicates but does not displace the relevance of the physiological mechanisms of perception. There are complexities added to our human capabilities and limitations as perceivers and observers, and they raise the stakes to the level of life and death. Ferguson, Beaver Creek, Staten Island, Cleveland, Albuquerque, Michael Brown, John Crawford, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, and many others in different places. In the images we think we see, that we create, and the subsequent narratives we form, what constitutes a figure, and what a ground. I recall a story told to me years ago by a curator of so-called outsider art. He had traveled alone into the Australian outback to spend time among the indigenous tribes in order to better understand the work they made in their social contexts. He spent quite a while there, out of communication with his world. They even gave him his own name, which initially sounded regal to him. He later realized it meant something like, man like white grub doesn't know shit. <laughs> he was useless among them. Whatever skills he had in our world were inapplicable in their context. He was like a big pink baby for whom they had to do everything. Something else was interesting about his experience. He was truly in a minority, minority position, one that few of us who are white have ever experienced. He was never able to forget his whiteness, the Aborigines were fortunately kinder to him than has historically been the case when the situation was reversed. But he got just a taste of being outside of a world he needed to fit into enough to survive. He wasn't stupid, but he was ill-equipped and untrained for the situation he was in. His sense of privilege was capsized. In most of the Western world, whiteness is the baseline, the assumption, the background noise against which perceived difference stands out usually not for any positive qualities of its own, but often for the discomfort it creates. Because whiteness is itself conventional by virtue of its prevalence and authority, individual white people aren't so much seen as white as they are observed in a more nuanced way that allows a closer look at their specific qualities. It was a very instructive time for him, perhaps that he needed to evoke this kind of help. When I was a child, a term for African Americans that was just leaving parlance was colored. Because I was young and literal-minded, I thought it was oddly humorous 
colored, like my drawings in a coloring book. <laughs> what color were they? Who colored them? After all, I could draw a person and arbitrarily color them any way I wanted. So what did this really mean? Colored as opposed to what? I did know that I wasn't literally white. Maybe I was ivory with rose base shade. The fictive concept of race is perhaps the outgrowth of a developmental quirk. Our apparent need to divide and segregate clan from clan, tribe from tribe, echoed fractally from the family unit to the nation state. We have found myriad ways to distinguish ourselves and create others, some of them quite subtle, but the invention of race by using skin color as a marker is the most obvious and optically succinct. Of all the constructs for differentiation, segregation, exclusion, and oppression, race is both the easiest and the most autistically visual method. You can de detect this difference from a hundred yards away. For the sociologist, racism might be seen to be culturally embedded, promulgated. Conversely, the evolutionary biologist might argue that the families, tribes, or clans' suspicion of the non-member is a necessarily ingrained part of our evolutionary past. One explanation does not preclude the other, and this much seems clear. These responses, perhaps initially visceral, became codified in racism, as similar ones begot misogyny and its ilk. They are like cancers. They may never be cured, only managed, and the struggle to do just that, with the ideal goal for eradication is impetus, is that much more important. But in order to manage such things, I think we need to begin, like John Berger made evident, with our consciousness raised, sounds like 1972 all over again, to become far more self-aware how we see and perceive others, the world outside ourselves as well as ourselves, and the art, images, narratives, and myths we inherit, create, and bequeath. Also, like Martin Berger, we need to be aware that in our cultural image bank, even those views chosen to advance the cause of the oppressed might be selected for ulterior motives and suppress a more complex narrative composed of many other, even contradictory, images. We need to question what is made visible, what are we being asked to look at, while also asking what was hidden to form this more convenient, clearer narrative. What are we missing? In this way, the aims of historical narratives and art digress. In art, there is no ethical imperative to know or represent everything you look at or are aware of. In fact, the myth of objectivity, ascribed particularly to camera-aided journalism, has long been seen as detrimental to the understanding of art. But this myth of objectivity in historical narrative retains its tenacious grip. Even when we know that the very, at the very least, that two observers can describe the same event very differently, without either necessarily seeing veracity. Earlier I talked about the heuristics of seeing the conventions and shortcuts we all apply every day to function, because it is impossible to always look. Out in the world, racism and profiling are gross forms of conventional seeing. While I might walk around along the street and say to myself, man, blue uniform, security, the law enforcement officer, looking the other way, might say to himself, black guy, boom car, threat. A black man might say, man, blue uniform, fear. We learn these things. We can train our intuitions in many ways, and the ways many of us are trained about race is that black is, at best, suspicious. So when Tamir Rice is waving a toy gun around in a Cleveland park in a way that aroused that suspicion, the police arrived and about two seconds later the boy was shot and killed. The heuristics of seeing are fully engaged and learned intuitive response are all one really has in a charged confrontation. There is no time for nuance, but when you have not really given the boy time to respond to a directive, when the assumption is malicious intent, even when other evidence contradicts it, when only the general categories of black, male, and gun are acknowledged before shooting, and when this is accepted as both necessary and sufficient information to shoot, then we just might have a perception problem, one that goes back hundreds, thousands of years 
and one that is only confirmed by the four minutes, in this case, between the shooting and any real medical assistance offered to the victim. Color black, value less than white. Gomberg says the familiar is always the likely starting point for rendering the unfamiliar. An existing representation will always exert itself over us even as we strive to record the truth. If a figure is flashed on the screen for a short moment, we cannot retain it without some form of classification, without heuristics. The police involved in the shooting might be brought before a grand jury and probably not indicted because according to the institutionalized and codified conventions of the system, this is how the narrative usually proceeds. In these situations, and usually in the protests that inevitably follow, everyone ends up fulfilling their stereotypical roles, especially in the eyes of their opposites. A complex, a complex nuanced situation has ended in another death. Color has been reduced to the convenient binary, the lie of black and white, and to a series of almost ritualized performances. This pattern is frequently repeated and seemingly intractable, as we know. It is worth noting that this occurrence and other similar ones have taken place in a time when increasingly it is legal for citizens to carry all manner of firearms in public. By what criteria the authorities will instantaneously discern licensed carriers from unlicensed ones is an interesting question. From the first part of my talk, I'll repeat this about our experience of color, how we need to be instructed and sensitized to properly see it, how color deceives all of us, how our perception of it is always conditional, how color sensitivity varies by individual. It is very hard but necessary to make the attempt to distinguish the specific characteristics of each of these violent incidents, regardless of their tendency to fit a pattern, just as it is necessary to look at look for and distinguish the specific qualities of the people we interact with, rather than projecting onto them, willfully or unwittingly, what we think we know about them. John Constable said, the art of seeing is a thing almost as much to be acquired as the art of reading hieroglyphics. In Gomberg again, the progress of seeing becomes a triumph over the prejudice of tradition. It is slow because it is so hard for us to disentangle what we really see from what we merely think we know, and to recover what John Ruskin called the innocent eye. We could say that we need to increase the refresh rate of what our historian Heinrich Wolfman called our history of seeing. What is called for, among other things, many other things, is perhaps a more nuanced approach to training our intuitions on the back end of this social problem. One that deconstructs these almost genetically inherited narratives that scrambles the tired pernicious myths and stereotypes on each side, that allows no one a free pass based on anything other than their humanity, which implicitly acknowledges that, under the wrong conditions and circumstances, any one of us can, can perform or behave badly, and that very few infractions or any position in the hierarchy of authority warrant summary executions. Selling loose cigarettes on Staten Island should not result in a sanctioned strangling death, for example. If we can begin to see a spectrum of color, see gradations of black and white, then and only then is there a chance that in the critical moments of confrontation, at that interface, so to speak, a marginally more complex interaction takes place long enough to distinguish another figure from its ground as something other than a target. Upon disembarking in New York in 1933, on his way to teach at Black Mountain College, leaving behind fascist violence and oppression and the closure of the Bauhaus, Josef Albers was asked what purpose he had in coming here. He said, to open eyes. In so many ways, we are still working in that. We'll always be working on that. Thank you.